Welcome to Wealthy Living Conversations. I'm Lisa, your host and founder of Wealthy Living. It's here that I connect with a variety of wonderful people to have inspiring and insightful conversations to help you live a meaningful, connected and well life, both personally and professionally. So I'm so proud to say that today I've reached a milestone and I'm recording my 50th episode. Woohoo! And of course, wanting to make this episode really special, I thought the most perfect guest would be my favourite person to have a wisdom chat with, my partner on a number of business projects, including soon to release a course with on relationship dynamics. Um, More on that later. And that is Natalie Martinek. So Natalie and I have recorded a number of wisdom chats on this podcast series. Actually, she was my very first guest on the show. We recorded an episode which still has the most downloads of the series. And that's an episode which was called How to Care Less While Still Being Caring. So today we thought we'd extend on this episode with a focus on increasing the likelihood of good interactions by taking a deeper look into how we address our needs. After all, we all want to have good interactions and when we do, we feel good and when we have shitty interactions, we don't feel so good. So let's talk a little bit more about this. So welcome Nat. Thank you, Lisa. It's great to be back with you. I know. It's so good. And, you know, we have so many chats, um, obviously most of them off air and even the ones that we've had on air, they've just, you're just able to share so much of your wisdom and, you know, I love all of our conversations and so many times we just wish we hit record on so many of our conversations. So it's so great to be able to hit record on our, on my 50th one. Thank you. And thank you for asking me. It's an honor to be here on your 50th after also being your first. I know. Pretty awesome. Just perfect. Let's see what comes out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so let me first tell you a little bit about Natalie. For those that don't know her or haven't listened to some, maybe some of the other episodes where I've introduced her. Okay, Natalie is an ex-cancer scientist who transitioned out of that controlled environment of the lab into the messy world of human behavior and relationships. She has a deep interest in the nature of codependent relationships and narcissistic behaviors, and expertise in the relational skills needed to build and maintain secure, fulfilling and therapeutic relationships. Natalie is a speaker, a listener, coach, and consultant who facilitates training programs and workshops worldwide for diverse professional audiences to enhance their capacity for human connection, abuse prevention, and healing through building purposeful relationships. Her book, The Little Book of Assertiveness, provides scripts and strategies to compassionately respond to tricky behavior, level power, and build boundaries to improve personal and professional relationships. So there is, you know, so many similarities between a lot of the stuff that Nat and I do, which is why we're coming together to soon release a course on relationship dynamics and um, and having healthy relationships and relating with confidence. So I'm really excited for that, um, that for that release soon. We'll be starting to record um, next week, actually. So hopefully um, not long into next year, that will be available. And that's exciting, huh, Nat? Yes, finally. I know, <laughs> finally, finally, finally. Okay, so... Let's get on to today's conversation about addressing our needs because that is something that, um, you know, so many people when they feel triggered and are challenged, it's because they have unmet needs or we have unmet needs. But the problem is so many people um, don't take the time to really assess their needs, their physical needs, their emotional needs and their mental needs. Um, Would you agree with that? Yes. And I, I also add social and spiritual needs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So, you know, a lot of people and in theory, when you go and maybe even put a Google search into, you know, a person's, a human's needs, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs model will come up. 
And I know you and I have had a few conversations about this model and I know you've got your own thoughts about it. And I'm wondering if you can share a little bit with the audience, um, the listeners, about the model, what it includes, the good things about it, and maybe some of the things where it's a bit limiting or some of your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, whoa, there's so much to say on this model alone. So um, there's a history behind this model that actually comes from um, uh, Indigenous communities in Canada uh, that depicts their, their version of uh, community well-being in a teepee, so a triangle. And I believe Maslow had some interaction with this, this group and I imagine was inspired to create his version, which is really about an individual's needs rather than a community-centered, a community-centric approach to recognizing that we all, a collective way of looking after each other. So um, basically, he structures our needs into five different dimensions. And it would appear that there's needs that are maybe more important than others based on this hierarchy that has been um, placed. The great thing about it is acknowledges we're humans and we have needs. And when these needs aren't met, we're going to have some problems. We're going to get sick. We're going to have problems in relationships. We're going to have problems managing our lives and to be able to express ourselves in the way that is meaningful and valuable um, and a way that is um, contributing to well-being of others. So the five different levels, the very bo bottom are our physiological needs. So eating, drinking, moving, breathing, resting or sleeping, um, excreting, which isn't really added there, but I think we'd have some problems if we're not able to excrete. <laughs> <laughs> the second level is about our safety. Um, so these seem to be categorized under physiological, but I would extend it a bit further into that it still affects psychological, spiritual, relational. So those are around uh, feeling safe and secure. It involves intuition and trust. It involves boundaries, including assertiveness as a way of expressing boundaries, uh, as well as knowing how to stay safe and knowing how to ask for help. So those are under the area of safety. The third level, the middle level, is about belongingness and love. Um, I would think of that as connection. So this is about relationships, the quality of the relationships we have, not just with other people, but with our environment, with nature, with any concepts of the divine or God or the universe or whatever it is that is meaningful to the person around connection. Um, the, the fourth level is around esteem. So it's a sense of feeling accomplished. It's our status in society or status in a group. It's the way we use our mind to make sense of things. It's gaining insights about our behavior and what drives us to act in certain ways or to react in certain ways. Um, it's also the ability to have curiosity, to be vulnerable, to question, question our place in the universe and in the world and in our different relationships. And the final level is often referred to self-actualization. So it's achieving one's full potential, um, including our ability to be creative. So it's our ability to shine in this world. It's about being on purpose, contributing meaningfully, um, being able to be authentic. And so the way it's depicted is that all the things we have to fulfill the things at the bottom, the needs at the bottom, um, before we can access our ability to self actualize. And so I'm going, to, and that's one way of interpreting it. I don't know if that's how Abraham Maslow wanted us to interpret it, but that's the way it seems to be interpreted because of the way it's structured. Yeah. So I'm going to throw a few different um, wrenches into this. Is that okay? Of course, <laughs> it's okay. Okay. So as COVID pandemic has revealed, especially around essential workers and those working in healthcare environments, that when their safety needs are not met, there's chaos and it leads to the moral injury and the distress and the trauma that they've experienced in feeling like the authorities haven't looked after them, that they're being exposed to this potentially deadly virus um, and expected to fulfill their role as um, healthcare workers without being adequately perfected protected. So what we're realizing is that safety is actually probably the most important um, dimension around this time. That if we don't feel safe with another person, if we don't feel safe in our environment, it doesn't matter if we're hungry or thirsty, we're going to be in a, in a constant state of threat. So if anything, safety 
is a foundation of the, our, our sense of safety and security and threat um, is determined by our past traumas, past experiences, wounded mm -hmm. wounds, as well as our current environment and interactions that we have, feeling safe with another person to ask for help, to disclose that we're in distress, to, to say, I need, I need protective equipment in order to do my job and feeling worried that if I ask for these things, I might get fired, I might get shamed, et cetera. Yeah. So that's, that's one thing I'm going to raise about um, this idea or notion of a hierarchy. Yeah, and before, thing you, before you go on to the next thing, let me just say something to that. Um, I think that what's really good in highlighting that safety is that, that foundation is because, you know, people think of safety being the most important, like in a responsive um, emergency situation, or it's always like safety first, you know, when you look at Dr. ABC, you know, dangers, response, you know, when you're looking at a, a, a situation where there's real danger, but people don't necessarily equate safety um, often to those things outside of the physical environment or their physical safety. And they don't think of things like you just brought up, like the trauma and things that can lead to feeling abused um, and their needs not necessarily being filled on the levels of outside of just the physiological or physical levels. So that's a really, really good point to make and for people to understand that the foundation, the safety foundation extends beyond just the physical environment. Mm. And yes, thank you. So um, that's a thing we could say probably about every dimension, that they're yeah. not these discrete dimensions, that they actually interact with each other, they're interdependent, and not one is more important than the other, that we actually need all of it. Like it should be maybe in a circle where all levels are equal or equitable, that we rely on, each, each relies on the other, because we're not compartmentalized people. We are, the way we express a need will have a bearing on the experiences we have in our relationships, the experiences we have uh, with our environment. So the, by co you know, couching safety needs as only physiological, we're missing out on the fact that we need psychological safety with each other in, in to work as a team, to work in a relationship. We need social, uh, not social, we need um, emotional safety. I need to know if I can trust this person to open up to them, even though they say I can. Can I actually? What is my intuition telling me about them? What are my past experiences telling me about my ability to trust them? And there's this notion of spiritual safety as well, which isn't often talked about. Again, it's being in a community of practice where we are going into these deep spaces of, of visiting our unconscious um, content and is it safe for me to do this? Is that leader safe for me to take me into this, into this space? Yeah. So it extends well beyond our physiological needs. And, also, and so same with our belongingness. It's well, well beyond um, how others perceive me because who tells me I can belong? Someone has to invite me in. Someone has to make space for me to belong. So what this model doesn't talk about is the inequity and inequality that is our society, that is our cult many cultures. It assumes that we all have the capacity to self-actualize when we know evidence tells us that's not the case. In order for us to self-actualize, we're likely needing to conform to a dominant culture, into a dominant way of being. And it's a lot harder if we don't have white skin and if we're not male. And uh, this is, you know, there's tons of data now around this. Um, so this model isn't looking at the context that we all exist in. It's assuming that we all have the same privilege, that we're all equal, and that everyone is able to treat each other equal. It's not a relational model. It's suggesting the individual should have the capacity that if they meet all these needs, that somehow they're gonna be able to express themselves. Um, but you have to be invited in to be allowed to meet those needs a lot of the time um, within the cultural context that you're in. Yeah. So because of that, it would be, a mistake to look at this model and go, oh, this is all I need to do in order to achieve my fulfillment and to self-actualize when not necessarily. Yeah. And that's, that I think also comes back down to, you know, really knowing your, yourself, your circumstance, um, the environment that you're in, the people that you're surrounding yourself with, yourself with your background, your, um, privilege or your lack of. Um, so I think it also comes down to make, you know, that discernment piece of being able to, for some people, um, the way that 
that Maslow's put this hierarchy of needs is going to work just fine. But for a whole lot of other people, it's not. And that doesn't make it good that it's so inequitable. And I think it's a really important point to make that it, that it isn't equitable. Um, but the, the, um, the sad reality is for some people, this model and generally, like you said, the, the, white male (laughs) it is um it is probably going to work relatively well but i think that it also um enhances the point that you made in the beginning and that's that safety is that foundation because this model doesn't work if safety isn't adequate Mm. Yes, you need to feel safe and secure in your world. And lots of people exist where they don't feel safe and secure in in this world and in their relationships, but somehow they pull on other resources within themselves and from other people and from around them in order to survive, um, which might tick the boxes of some of these other dimensions. But if the approach they're taking is their survival above others, then there's going to be some collateral damage with other people in order to meet their needs. So a quest, another aspect of this that Maslow doesn't consider is how, if I'm going about meeting my needs in order to self-actualize, am I, in the way that I'm doing it, am I oppressing or am I participating in maintaining a, an inequality in certain relationships that I have or with me, at, with society at large or me within my uh, cultural context? Yeah. Is how I'm meeting them perpetuating an inequality? Um, am I oppressing someone else in order to meet my needs? Because the way this sits right now is that in order to in act self-actualize, it's almost giving p- people permission to do what's necessary in order to do that. But yeah. if we have an eth- a guide, an ethical guide, then we know, well, maybe the way I'm going about it, I need to assess um, risks and potential harms. And we don't always like to think about unintended consequences of our actions, but yeah. I think we're in a time where we need to be more accountable and this doesn't have accountability attached to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, it, you know, you can relate it in a level like a high level like that of, you know, the greater population and all the different groups of people and, um, you know, how much oppression or, um, or harm we're causing um, other groups of people while we get our own needs met. But we can also look at exactly that same principle on a very day-to-day level in your own family unit, in your classroom situation, in your, you know, your work situation, your intimate relationships, like your friendships. So there's so many levels that even taking it out of the, um, the diversity of a population, it's at what expense are you going to go to and the expense of others in order to get your own needs met? And yeah, what am I sacrificing? What are you, yeah, and what, and what, not are you sacrificing for yourself, but what, it, what, who, are you, who else are you sacrificing in order to meet your needs? And that's the, that fine-tuned balance, isn't it? Because like I said in the beginning, so much of the time we, um, as, as humans, are triggered or are challenged or suffer because our own needs aren't being met. And so we have to work out a way to how do we meet our needs um, so that we do flow with life more easily, so that we do um, have more joy and um, and therefore having more joy and more inner peace, we can maybe come to our relationships with more kindness and care and compassion and understanding. But how do we do that Well, we're not necessarily harming um, phys- physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, anybody else or any other group of people? And so then we come to that, I suppose, conundrum of like caring for my needs compared to caring for other people's needs. Yeah. Um, or caring for my needs and then looking at that in a context. So if in my caring, caring for my needs, how am I going about it? And without overthinking it, you know, it's not like questioning every, everything that we do, you know, we have needs, but but sometimes, you know, a situation calls us to make choices that can have a bearing on someone else or a number of people. Uh, Can I live with that? Is that something that aligns with my, the way I go about it is aligning with my own ethical principles and values. Yeah. So those are questions that I think are worth asking. Um, in how we look after ourselves and how we care for others as well. 
Yeah, which is then really coming back to that idea which I bang on about all the time of, you know, really getting this solid core foundation of looking, well, what are your values, including your ethical principles? Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then making choices that are aligned with those. Yeah, so I think the other thing about this model is that the question is, well, how, how are we going about meeting our needs? Who am I recruiting in my life to meet certain needs? And is that their role? Yep. What role are they playing? What role have I put them in or they've put themselves in because of the family dynamics that they're used to being involved in? In my friendships, are we playing out a parent-child relationship here? Am I expecting this person to give to me like I would expect a parent to give to me? And is that actually useful to them. So these are types of codependencies, you know, we're playing out a role where there is an exchange, but someone's needs are going to be met over someone else's. So in society, there's lots of ways that we go about meeting our needs, but in, a, in types of code, there's, I think, uh, everything's on a spectrum or a continuum. Yes. So yes. sometimes um, we think about others' needs first before our own, because we can have this impression that, oh yeah, I'm already meeting my needs. I don't, I don't need anything. I'm strong. They're weaker than me. They're sicker than me. They're less than me. So they need me more or they need something from me more. And if we have this perception about other people and our identity or a role in their life, then we're always going to be considering other people and never ourselves. And eventually we're going to develop these resentments. We're going to develop expectations that if I'm willing to do it for them, they should be willing to do that for me but we've had the codependency <clears throat> where they're reliant on me to provide their supply, their energy supply, their resource supply. And there has never been an agreement that they would do the same for me. Yes. But if I have that expectation, I'm going to get pissed off when they don't need, they don't meet mine when it's my turn. Yeah. So that's, I suppose we're looking at it now, making the assumption in the beginning that, okay, so, you know, by looking after, um, we're now we've kind of now flipped it of of not just looking at um, our own needs ahead of other people that could cause harm to others. We're looking at what a lot of people do, and that's that they spend so much time caretaking other people's needs or other people's perceived needs, and um, and then don't address their own. And um, and yeah, and that I suppose, like you said, really can cause conflicts within a relationship because yeah like it's not agreed upon that they that they're going to behave or make choices the same way you are and us and, <coughs> um and i think a lot of people fall into the trap of having a belief that the more effort that they put in it will guarantee a better relationship and that's just not true i mean it's important to put in effort but it doesn't guarantee that if you keep doing something for someone over and over again and you're there for them continuously that it's going to guarantee a better relationship um no. actually a lot of opposite. the time it's the opposite <laughs> yeah i mean it can yeah. it can up until a certain level but then yeah. like you said when the resentment builds when they're not do, when they're not reciprocating the same way that you do um resentment is the the biggest killer or downfall of of relationships. Yeah. Um, it's hard to break out of those patterns as well because they've been established since birth. Um, we've been, you know, there's many examples of children taking on adult responsibilities because their 30 authority figures or parents have shown that they're not capable of meeting the mm -hmm. child's needs. So they adopt the parent role and start taking that responsibility and they tend to go into healthcare practice or, you know, other nurturing and caring roles in life. Um, where they get to replay that role over and over and over. And it's because they're conditioned, they're used to it. That's, that's the way it is. And until they're asked, well, what is it that you want? What are your desires? A lot of the time they can't answer that question mm. because they never had the chance to stop and think about, well, what do I want? Mm. Because what I want is actually dependent on someone else's needs. And so they've developed an identity that is dependent or is connected to the needs of someone else or someone else's identity, someone else's purpose or mission or the way that they go about self-actualizing. So they never had the ability to stop and go, well, these are the needs that I have. Um, and these are the desires that I have mm -hmm. that express myself. So that's why there's a lot of burnout. There's a lot of um, disillusionment mm -hmm. and uh, unfulfillment because 
that the awareness about, well, what do I want? Hasn't really kicked in or that I, that I'm allowed to have things that I want. And if I had gone through my whole life, not really doing what I want, but doing more of what is expected of me or the recreating the pattern or playing out the pattern of me always looking after other people's needs above my own, then I don't even know who I am. I don't even know what is my deep yearning desires because I haven't had the chance to actually consider that. Yeah, there's so much in that, Nat. You know, there's this ho- the whole idea of, you know, just also that person, um, if you have grown up in a way that you have felt good enough in life or felt like, um, I suppose, succeeded as a child because you were able to take on that role, then um, you want to continuously be perceived as that caring, compassionate person um, because without that, who are you? Because that's all you've ever known. And, yeah, there's like, you know, breaking through that before you get so drained and burn out that you're actually unable to take care of anybody else, including yourself. So Mm -hmm. it's like... Or you're forced to look after yourself, finally. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Kind of like a a buildup of a lifetime, finally going, okay, now you got to look after yourself. Now you need to receive all the times that you've given and given and given to other people. It's your turn to receive. Because I think (coughs) there's an expression, sorry, (coughs) there's an expression a give and take. And I think that's part of the flaw. There's a perception that someone's always giving and the other person is taking, whereas there's a give and receive, which is more equitable. I'm giving and I'm also able to receive. Yeah. And when I've established those relationships with people, and sometimes we have to be explicit about our expectations, and we'll talk about that in our relationship course, um, so that we are able to go, I have a tendency to overgive all the time. And I build resentment because it doesn't come back to me. So I want to, I'm going to check in every so often to make sure that, and I ask you to do the same, that we're, everything seems equal between us and that we are giving and receiving. And I know that's weird. We don't usually do this, but I don't, I don't want to hate you at some point. I want to continue to love you and have a really great lifelong relationship as far as we can go. And these are the ones that are the things I have to do. Is that all right? You know? Yeah, and, it, and look, these are all really, and this is where we'll go over it, like you said, in more detail in the relationships course, because these are all a lot of things that we need to unlearn and relearn. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're skills. They're not just things that we just happen to be really good at. They're skills that need to be learnt and practised. If- yeah. And if we were good at it, we wouldn't have codependencies. We wouldn't have abuse in relationships. We wouldn't have violence. It's we're yep. shit at it. And that's where this is the things that we are trying to unravel, dismantle and liberate from over and over and over. That cycle continues over until we, are, we know what equitable relationships look like and what boundaries and structures need to be in place to support it and maintain it. <coughs> as well as how do we hold each other accountable in loving and compassionate ways when we don't do it because we have our past triggers, traumas, woundings, and things that will get in the way. And yep. how do we do it without condemning each other? How do we move through it in a way yeah. that helps us? And how do we allow, evolve. and how do we allow the space? Like when we, be, if you, if somebody is that person who is that continual, I suppose, more um, person that gives more than the, than they receive. Um, and they actually fill their own tank until they don't, until they're so drained. But in the beginning, they feel like they're filling their own tank of feeling good and feeling important and feeling like they've got a place and an identity, but not realising that at some, at some level, everybody deserves that feeling of, of giving to another. And so by being, by taking that space up in a relationship, whether it be a work relationship or a personal relationship, you're not actually giving the other person that opportunity to, um, to give as well so that you're, you take that receiving role. And I think that's the equitable thing as well. Like actually giving each other both those opportunities to play both roles. Yeah. I mean, you know, an example that comes to mind when you're with what you've just said is friendships where one person in the friendship happens to be a sort of therapist, counselor, kind of caretaker type. And in the friendship, when one friend has the problem, the 
there's an automatic assumption that the therapist person will just play out their role and provide that support. So they're always expected to give, give, give. What ends up happening is when that therapist role person ha- needs support, the other person doesn't know how to give it because they feel inferior because like, I can't do for you what you do for me. And that remains unspoken. And so that person who's always giving doesn't get, doesn't get the opportunity to receive because they always played out a role of problem managing with that person rather than listening and going, I don't know how to help you with this right now. I'm here for you. Let's hear your understanding of what's going on for you. Let me help you explore this so we can each get a deeper understanding of what is happening. And that is a way of maintaining this equality rather than I'm stepping in this role and I'm going to be this expert and provide this expertise for you because that's what I do in my job or this is what I naturally do because I'm that natural caretaker because of my upbringing. So it's not that we're, that there's an opportunity to receive. It's that we're not really great at receiving because we're too good at being amazing for other people. And um, it creates that imbalance or it maintains an imbalance. Yeah. So perhaps we or you could redefine what compassionate, good person actually means and realising that boundaries are being a good person, not necessarily there for just being like um, resisting, you know, like a resistance that actually that having boundaries and setting boundaries and not just being a giver, 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 giver all the time is actually um, a good quality. So maybe you can just talk through that a little bit and redefine your, in your, in your take, what a compassionate good person actually means. Whew. That's a, I feel like that's a loaded question. All right. Well, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, I'll begin. Right, I'll yeah. try to answer it as best as I can. And I'm <laughs> going to draw on my cultural roots, my cultural tradition and wisdom and ancestral tradition from, you know, our, our Jewish tradition yeah. um, and coming through the, the Kabbalah, which is the, the oral tradition and the, the received wisdom. Sorry um, to be on the spot, Nats. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. So one of the ideas that I've come, that's come into mind around compassion is that it's a balance of opposites. So on one hand, one side is always giving, 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 and the other side is creating a restriction or a restraint. So we need to balance these two opposites. And I see compassion as generosity with boundaries. If we have no boundaries, we're always giving, giving, giving. We're going to be rescuing people from their suffering and their emotions when it's not a life and death situation. Life and death situation has their own rules, but for the majority of the time, it's not a life and death situation. It's not an emergency, but we treat it that way. And so when someone shares a problem, we try to fix it and we don't let them have their experience. And so that's this kind of generosity that is almost toxic because it prevents them from having having the experience, giving them permission to just feel your feelings and then creating the circumstances so they can get a deeper understanding of what's going on for them, which is empowering for them and tapping into their resourcefulness and which is confidence building, empowering, and that you facilitated that it creates that intimacy in in the relationships. There's so many benefits of not jumping in and rescuing, trying to fix because I'm so uncomfortable with the suffering they're experiencing that I'm doing it more for me than them. So that's the self-restraint stuff. So I'm like, I'm ner- you know, I'm feeling uncomfortable with this emotion they're showing, but I'm going to sit here and hold space for them because this is not about me. This is about them. So that when we talk about self-restraint, that's a boundary. I'm going to put this boundary in on myself because I'm going to wait and see what emerges from them and from this moment together. So that's what I call compassion. It's having also wisdom and discernment to know what the right action is that isn't going to undermine them and create an inequality between us or perpetuate an inequality between us that I have to trust that they have some resourcefulness. They may not have the answer, but I definitely don't have the answer. So let's see what can emerge from the collaboration between the two of us. That is going to be not only just for them, that I'm going to receive something from this too, because when someone has a problem, there's some relevance to me in something that's going on in my life. There's this kind of economy. So I need to also be receptive to what emerges from them. Because if we think we're the caretaker and the expert, then we're never going to learn from someone else. It's going to be hard unless we go, oh, you're an authority enough that I can now trust and listen to. And I only want to receive from you when we can actually receive from so many people at any time if we're receptive. So that's my idea of compassion is generosity or love with boundaries. I love it. 
I love it. And there is just, um, oh, there's so much wisdom. You know, I was like, as you're speaking, boom, 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 word, word, word. <laughs> I just was like, there's so many things I wanted you're to say. You're writing furiously. And I, and, I had to, and I had to practice my constraint <laughs> of keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> but you spoke all of that because there were so many things that came to mind because there is just so much wisdom in, um, in what you just said. And it is true that that compassion, I love it, generosity with boundaries. And, um, and even I think, I think maybe you've said in another time um, that love is compassion with boundaries or that some, I think something like that. Um, well, something mm, like that. I can't but, remember. Yeah, I but, think I was talking but, about, yes, love, love. It just incorporates so many different attributes yeah. that again, I think about the, the Kabbalah and the tree of life and all the different attributes, which define the attributes that we each have. And that there needs to be a bet. There's a balance of opposites. And then when we're able to come to the middle ground and the middle ground is going to be different in every moment and in every context and situation. But when we're able to access that, there's a level of empowerment and confidence that emerges from it, not just for one party, but both and everyone involved. Yeah, absolutely. So again, we're relational. What yeah. happens in me, with me, my actions have an impact on someone else. I have an effect on others. And so I think about if I'm meeting my needs, my need to feel relevant through helping someone else, then what's the impact I'm having? Sure, I might help them, but it might create a precedence where they're always seeking that out for me, or it might meet, create a, a precedence for me to always seek approval from someone else that I can't just feel happy for my, in myself that I'm always needing it from someone else, yeah. someone with influence and authority. And when I don't get it, I'm going to feel like crap and I'm going to need my next fix. So again, we have needs. It's, uh, we need to meet them, but it's who am I recruiting? How am I recruiting them to meet that need? And is it going to be sustainable? And is it promoting equality or, uh, maintaining a codependence? Or is there a way of us interacting interdependently we're two different people we have our two different identities and we are bringing our skills our expertise our knowledge our wisdom past experience collaborate collaboratively in order to solve a problem or um, facilitate an emergence of some pearl of wisdom that's going to support both of us that's yeah. the ideal yeah absolutely and you know that you use this word again and i wrote it down when you used it before because i just thought that it's just perfect is collaboration and i think that a lot of people when they think of collaboration they think of work projects or you know or things that are you know more businessy but actually life and relationships are about collaboration and it is it's about how can we work together in order to um to achieve a really um sustainable and um and great outcome for both parties involved and it's mm -hmm. you know it is that it is that collaborative approach rather than that and that's really the only way of equity isn't it because mm. um you know when it's not a collaborative approach there's generally some sort of a hierarchy of inferior and superior within a situation and yes there's no doubt about it that in certain situations one person may have more knowledge or more wisdom on a specific topic or more experience on a specific topic than somebody else and yes it's um it's okay to impart that wisdom and impart that knowledge but to be able to do it in such a skillful way with what you mentioned before the discernment discernment in in communicating in a way that um, that feels collaborative, that doesn't just shut down somebody's feelings, that gives both parties the opportunity to express how they feel and what their needs are and what they want to achieve and what they're feeling. So, yeah, there's... Mm. there's and, uh, yeah, just to throw another thing, when we're talking about equity, it's also acknowledging our relative privilege. So yeah. if I'm with a person... You know, as a Jewish woman, I have my level of privilege and my level of oppression and, and history around that. And then with a different person as well, I'll have that. So it's being aware. So it's bringing that awareness in the moment of like, what is our perceived status in society based on our skin color, based on our educational level, our socioeconomic status, all these different things, because we are not coming into a relationship as equals, unfortunately. So we have to do the work to create that equality and in the way that we meet our own needs, in the way that we support each other's meeting of needs. And um, we can't do that if we just assume, uh, you know, we, we don't consider the history and the context that we're all in. And again, that's not part of Maslow's. 
I just want to say one more thing about Maslow's is if we try to meet every single one of the, the needs on that list, we're, it's not going to be possible. Mm. So I think a, a better way of looking at it or more an economical or efficient way of looking at it is what is the problem that is my priority problem right now in my life? Yes. And based on that problem, I'll go, what dimension is my problem in? And often it's in the safety area and it's probably around boundaries and assertiveness <laughs> Um, in order to express my needs in a way that doesn't impose it on others, but lets people know, no, I won't be able to do that. And if I need to, here's why, and or here's what I can do instead, or no, can I get back to you? That sort of thing. These are sort of the skills um, about expressing our needs in a way that it will be received um, or more likely to be received. So it's noticing what is the big problem that is a priority for right now? What dimension is that problem in? And there's a set of skills that um, you know, this, this is uh, an adaptation of the model that was developed by Eva Migdal, who we both know, yep. um, in her, her own coaching, um, her peer coaching model, and basically breaking down each dimension into a set of skills, because we're trying to create better habits of relating of, and of meeting our needs um, that are sustainable and nourishing. So if my issue is in safety, then some of the skills are asking for help, uh, staying safe, boundaries and assertiveness, trust and intuition, um, and physical protection. So those are some examples of skills. So I'd be like, what is the skill that I need in order to ex exert my level of control to restore a sense of balance back into this situation? Yeah. And it's a very empowering process if we know how to do it. So whereas the way it's presented, it would suggest that we have to somehow be well fed and slept and then we'll be able to climb the ladder. And yeah. that's not exactly the way life works. No, <laughs> but the way we're able to deal with that one problem, the skill that we express to resolve that one problem or to address that problem will have flow on effects in other parts of our lives as well as in our relationships. And we'll be course. asked to have to express that skill in a, in a different way um, with a number of people, because the problem isn't just this one thing. It's alerting us of what's not quite right in a number of places in our life. So if I address it in this one situation, I'm going to gain the confidence to be able to address it in you know, similar relational dynamics to create more of that equality if that's what I want. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, everything does have a ripple effect. And if you are listening at the moment and, um, and you're thinking, well, that's all really, that's all, that's all great, but it's, it seems so difficult to, you know, I'm not practised at this. I think in the beginning it's about really um, pausing and, you know, pulling yourself up a lot of the time and, and, you know, just thinking about the situation, thinking about the circumstance, thinking about what your needs are in that circumstance that needs being met and, um, and then what sort of actions that can be taken step by step in order for that, um, for those needs to be met, obviously, you know, in a safe um, and equi equitable way. Um, and over time, you won't need to pause as much because it'll be more practiced and you'll be able to, the intuition or the, you know, the wisdom that you've, that you've integrated or the knowledge that you've integrated through the practicing will become more natural. And you'll be able to do these things um, with greater discernment at the time without needing to pause and reflect as much as you might maybe now. Yeah. And that's only really available to people who are able to meet their needs in that way. Um, so people need to have self-awareness, which is a, an area of esteem or, yeah. or uh, mind, as Eva would call it. You need to have behavioral insights. So what is motivating these actions that I keep doing and having the same results? So you need to be reflective. And yeah. a lot of the time, we're not, we're not able to do that, which is why coaches are amazing you know, wellness coaches or, you know, what we do, shameless plug, but that's it. That's how I developed my ability. I had coaching and a good coach will support people to develop these reflective skills, assertiveness skills, um, habit breaking and new habit forming skills in a way that's gentle, that doesn't force people to try to break and change because this is part of our identity. This is part of what keeps us safe. So we need to take time to practice a skill little by little, little every day and it becomes a new habit. And we can't necessarily do that our own. We need support to do it. So that's under the safety dimension of asking for help and knowing yeah. what the right help is for the thing that you want to, for the need that you want to get better at meeting. 
That's right. And that's, you know, that's basically, you know, part of the topic today is how do we address the, address our needs? How do we meet our needs? And one of our needs might be um, to have our needs met. <laughs> I know that sounds a bit confusing. <laughs> but, you know, um, so what support, And who's going to help me with that? That's right. Yeah. So what support do I need to be able to meet my needs? And mm-hmm. one of those areas that you need is support support yep support Support for support yeah yeah i know it's a bit of a mind bender and or having people in your life who you know you don't necessarily employ to support you but certain friends who are great listeners who don't take their response the responsibility to have to solve your problem so they're able to express compassion generosity with boundaries and help you explore your own landscape your internal landscape your your relational landscape so that you can come to a greater understanding of what's going on and then nudge you gently to support you to take an action to resolve that again meeting our needs is about recognizing where am i in control in this situation where do i have control what's not in my control Mm. that i i can't even deal with it's not even up to me so where can i have control because when i'm able to exert control i can alleviate that suffering of feeling helpless powerless hopeless um and that's why we need each other because and that's again what maslow isn't necessarily saying in the way that uh, the model is is laid out is we're relational we rely on each other but to do it in a way that is cultivating interdependence rather than a codependence which is going to be one person is going to gain one person's going to lose one's yeah. going to get a supply of energy and the other person's going to be drained of their energy and we all have experiences like that i know it yeah absolutely we all do and i'm sure anybody who's listening would you know, maybe resonate with and be thinking of a, you know, a relationship which that does occur where there's this self-centeredness and, you know, and other-centered, you know, like that codependence. And um, whereas, like you said, what we aim for is that independent interdependence, the middle ground where we can Mm. give and we can receive and there's more of that equality. And obviously, you know, the more that we can have those interdependent relationships, the, um, the, the flow on effect and the ripple effect is going to be huge. And, you know, it will completely change the way that um, humans relate with each other in the inner circles and the outer circles to just keep flowing on and flowing on. And, and that's really what the greater purpose I feel from the work that I do is, and I'm sure you, Nat, as well, and, you know, and generally is, you know, to, to have that flow on effect go out and out. Yeah. And sometimes to break the habit of always being other focused is to become a radical self-centered person where you spend a bit of time only considering your needs. And because we're on one extreme, we can't go into a middle. We don't know what middle is yet. We sometimes have to go to the opposite extreme to first find out what the hell do I need after a lifetime of not even considering that and only looking after it and telling people, this is the pattern I've set up for myself. I need to stop doing it. This is the way I'm going about it. You might not like it. This is just what I'm trying out. Please love me anyway and understand. And you just, you know, be transparent, be explicit, let people know what's going on. Hopefully, you know, they'll get it. If they don't get it, you may not want them in your life anymore. Yeah. And it gives you that freedom, um, maybe m- losing some toxic relationships. But radical self-centeredness has a place when you have been other focused your whole life. You need to learn, what do I need? What are my desires? And once you're able to do that, you get a different experience of life. I guarantee it. I've witnessed it. I've facilitated. It's just amazing. And then you can start to think about, okay, how do I create this balance between looking after my needs while considering how it impacts someone else and how do I help someone else that doesn't put all my energy into them and make sure that there's a flow between us. Yeah. Um, Nice energy flow between us. So that comes more into that interdependence. Yeah. And I think that what's really important, um, I think what the key to something you just said then around suggesting people go into that radical self centeredness the key to that and the key to the success of that without damaging too many relationships while you're doing it um, and without feeling an immense sense of guilt while you're doing it is communication. You will anyway. (laughs) You will anyway. No, is communication and transparency. And so if you can communicate really openly and really transparent, 
confidently to say, this is what I'm doing, this is why I'm doing it, and I need to do this in order to get to this place of interdependence so that somebody else has a greater understanding, the people that you're relating with have a greater understanding that you're not just being an, you know, uh, selfish an a-hole you know <laughs> yeah 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 you only care um, about yourself and you're like yeah i'm only caring about myself right you're now actually yeah. actually not just this really selfish person that you actually mm. just need to go through this process in order to flip things so that you can then veer to where you want to want to get to and yeah. Pattern and breaking. That's right. Take some radical moves sometimes. That's yeah. right. So I think that as yeah. long as you're number one, communicating it really transparently and also perhaps putting a bit of a time frame on it, you know, yeah. and I'm not saying that the time frame has to be, you know, an exact number of weeks or exact number of days. It's going to be different depending on what, how long, you know, your patterns go on for and how quickly you integrate things um, as a person. But, you know, it doesn't give you permission to just do that for the next, you know, two years. Um, <laughs> yeah. A new habit sets in 40 days with consistent action on a daily basis. So, you know, radical self-centeredness isn't, I'm going to just ignore my family and my children. You know, this is contextual, the way we apply these these. Um, <laughs> advice or this information. So it might be an hour a day where this is my time and this is all I'm doing and no one's allowed to bother me. And if you bother me, these will be the consequences. And so it is untouchable. So it might be just that block of time and you try it out for a 40 day period of time and you make sure you have some support to be successful, like an accountability buddy or a coach or whatever. So it's, it's like that. It's creating some structure when we have lived life without as much structure around the way we relate with others because we've had this endless generosity yeah. without the boundaries or with, you know, a loose boundary or what, whatever. And now it's like, this is a strong boundary. It's going to seem harsh. You know, that's just how I need to do this right now to break a pattern and form a better one. And then I'll assess after the 40 days and start to think about how can I bring more balance to the way I do this so that I'm now able to remember that I have needs and, and, um, and uh, consider them when I make decisions. Yeah. And obviously if you're living alone or on your own, it's going to be a hell of a lot easier, but if you are yeah. living with other people, maybe it's also really um, a good, a good suggestion to maybe um, also invite them to give you feedback along the way and what's not working for them and you may go great that's not working for you but it's working for me and I'm going to continue doing that um or you might go yeah that's that's fair that's completely valid and you're right that that's actually really harmful and perhaps maybe I can tweak it by doing this how, how would that feel and so yeah. You know, I think that it's really important if you are with other people that you're also, um, you're looking after yourself and you might make this decision to be radically self-centred, but that you also perhaps invite um, feedback from those that you happen to be cohabitating with. Yes, and feedback can be delivered in a very specific way that gives examples, that isn't blaming, that's, you know, if they say this, I'm finding what you're doing is really, you know, unhelpful or triggering or whatever, then you say, why, what is it about it? And we will often discover it's that because I'm no longer meeting that person's need and yeah. they don't have anyone else to do that. And so it's like, ah, is it because I've been meeting that need for you? And now I've taken that away and you're feeling a bit lost. So how can, you know, how do we deal with this? Because I'm not prepared to go back to meet your needs because it's draining yeah. and you don't want that either because you're dependent on me. Don't you want to be not dependent? I don't know. Depends again, nature of the relationship and the ability to have those conversations. I, you know, they're not always available, those conversations. Yeah. So all we can do in the end is uh, try our best. And, um, you know, that's, that's sometimes our needs are no longer to be friends or in relationship with other people. Yeah. And that's what's going to be um, the product of this kind of work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, um, Another thing to to mention is that within a relationship, um, whether it's a personal or professional relationship, there's different phases. And it's not like just you have a whole lot of needs and you just want those needs, um, that those needs remain the same. At different stages of different relationships, there are different needs and those needs will continuously change. And that's, mm. again, why it's so important to um, to stop and pause and just 
connect with what your needs are and reflect on on what what you what communi- you know what you need and how to communicate that and so i think that it's really important to understand that things like needs aren't stagnant and they're not static you know and they're continuously dynamic and need to be reassessed and changed depending on the stage of the relationship good point yes and i guess needs and values are also used interchangeably yeah. Um, sometimes. So yeah, different, we have different values that come to the fore in our diverse relationships. So how I relate to a boss will be re- different to how I relate to a friend. So the values that will be at the fore will be different with a friend versus, you know, an authority figure like an employer or a parent or a child um, or a therapist. So Again, how often do we sit down and assess what our values and needs are in these different relationships? It's only when they're not being met and there's conflict that we start to pay attention, which is yeah. a good thing. Yeah, and, wow. and and that also, you know, I suppose just brings back to that, um, to what you said before when you were saying, like, it's not about just um, having to meet every one of those hierarchy of needs that Maslow puts out. It's about looking at, well, what do I need right now in this context, in this circumstance, and in this relationship. Hmm. That doesn't require me to add additional time to my day to do this task, (laughs) that it's within my routine. Because if it's not within my everyday routine, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. So again, what makes it easy for us to take action, to exert a sense of control that aligns with our values, that fulfills a need, that doesn't hurt other people in doing so. (laughs) It's a lot of consideration. But again, if, if, if ethic for me, my values, my principles around ethics are are way up there. Mm -hmm. And so I consider the effect of my actions. I don't say I do it all the time, but that is a high consideration for me. And I, I really want that that intention that I have to be experienced by the other person. So I want to have the desired impact or outcome. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, I'm not responsible for how other people receive me or their behaviors or anything like that, but I can do my best. That's how I hold myself accountable. Did I do the thing that I said I was going to do that aligns with these ethical principles and values? Then I feel okay in whatever happens next, even though it might be what happens next is, is conflict or, or whatever. At least I feel okay that I upheld my moral standards and um, wasn't a dick to the other person. Um, And how they receive it and how they respond to me, again, is up to them. And, you know, that's what relationships are about. Yeah, absolutely. Which is a whole set of other conversations that we will be having very soon. Yes, exactly. Where So, you know, there is a lot that we obviously tried to cover just then within this um, short episode or not so short episode. It's <laughs> not so short. <laughs> Probably almost an hour. But, um, but there is so much more to be said. And as you can tell, there's so many things that have come up. And, you know, it's when I speak, Nat just wants to write all these things, you know, and add this and add that and add this. And when she speaks, there's a whole lot of words that obviously come to mind that I want to contribute to as well. And um, and so that's why we've decided to come together and um, and put together about 10 different conversations on all things to do with relationship dynamics um, to help you relate with more confidence um, so that you can have better outcomes and better relationships and healthier relationship dynamics. So, yeah, we're going to get on to, we've, we've um, nutted out a lot of those topics in a lot of those episodes um, and it's just about recording some of them now. So, yeah, that's really exciting. And I think it's an area that is just um, not probably addressed enough. But like we said before, um, if, if people can start um, relating better, the ripple effect is just huge. And, you know, we live, like you said, humans live are here as relational beings. We're not islands. We're not, you know, although some people seem to act like it sometimes we aren't we're here and we're relational and we learn through relationships um so which to ourselves and to others and to the planet so yeah it's exciting very thank you And, um, you know, when we do go through that, we'll go through a lot more of the strategies and scripts and um, ways to communicate needs and and other parts of relationships. And Nat has written, like I said before, in her little book of assertiveness, there's a whole lot of scripts in there as well, um, which will make 
um, available for the um, workshop as well and any other time because it's on your website now? Yes, it is. Awesome. So what's, yes. the, what's the website? Oh, my website is drnataliemartinek.com and you'll find a link to the book and it shows retailers from around the world, wherever you are. And um, yeah, just, and I encourage everyone to shop locally and support your country's local booksellers um, who stock the book, or you can get the ebook for your gadget, your device to have. So a few people have said it's been helpful. They got the print book and the ebook because at times it's great to have these scripts on demand. <laughs> so yeah. they whip out their phone and go, oh, that's the situation that she's talking about. Here's some scripts. I'm going to give it a go. So, yeah, because uh, really the hardest thing that people find is not knowing what to say. And they go, and, you know, they're having a situation, um, you know, their need got trampled on or they're, you know, they're just in a, in a situation where they freeze and they, they feel paralyzed and they don't know what to say. So having the language to communicate, um, customized to the way that you would say it, um, is really helpful. And, uh, yeah. It can do a lot to not have that moral distress from not standing up in the way that you would have liked to, to address something, to address a, a crappy situation uh, and not feeling able to stand up for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such a great little book and it's, um, yeah, it really does have those really good tips and little scripts and you don't need to learn them off by heart like Nat says, you know, it's just about putting them into context for yourself, but, you know, just being able to read them and give, and give yourself some practice at being able to look at how you can communicate in ways that are a little bit more effective or a lot more effective, actually. <laughs> Hopefully a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or just effective. That's right. It's either effective or ineffective. Effective. Okay. Doesn't yeah. have to be a lot. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Lisa. Great oh, chat. Pleasure. As always. Thank you. It's always such a pleasure and it's such an inspiration talking to you. I love our chats and um, we've got about, oh, I've got about three, this is about, I think, the fourth, fourth episode we've done in the series and um, celebrating the 50th um, as a... Yay, as an episode that sort of continued with some of the content from episode one that we did mm. together. So, yeah, and then leading on to obviously the um, the course that I've just been rambling on about. So yes. if you are interested in our upcoming Relationship Dynamics course where you'll learn to build confidence in relating skills, um, I will put in the show notes a link to an expression of interest mailing list. And then when we have more details, we will send you out... Um, those details so yeah sounds good to in, me i'll put that in the show notes so you know nat and i would love to hear your biggest takeaway or insight from today's conversation and if you've got any specifics um, of scripts that you want us to comment on then maybe leave a comment on um this wherever you're listening now or you can um leave a comment on either of our socials when we promote the episode and um, we might be able to write a few things there um, but yeah if you want any more information on myself or on Natalie just see our social media sites or our website and um, they will all be on the show notes so if you have enjoyed today's episode please share it with your friends and consider subscribing to the Worldly Living podcast on iTunes and on YouTube to find out more about my services as you said can go to wealthyliving.com.au. So until next time, remember that connection is medicine. <laughs>